Hello everyone and welcome to Shiju's Chronicles. You can definitely see another face on the screen with me today. He's gonna introduce himself shortly. Um because he's here to share his admission story, his journey, so that you know everyone else out there who is interested in a similar program with him, or even if you're not interested in a similar program, but you just want to know what it's like studying at the graduate level in the US, like you can learn from a story so without further ado i'm going to hand it over to him i'm going to ask him to introduce himself is there any smiling and ready for us so over to you caleb you want to like yeah introduce yourself tell us a little bit about yourself and how your journey abroad started mm. well um my name is caleb uh, i am actually first year mba student at carlson school of management minnesota uh, I started this fall, my admission started this fall, mm -hmm. uh, from Nigeria, as you know. I'm from the other states, I used to work as a risk management consultant in KPMG before I started my MBA. Oh, nice. Um, so, how did I start this journey, admission journey, right? Uh, yeah. So, uh, I think it was after uh, COVID, after COVID to be this and I decided to you know move on from KPMG and try other avenue and decided to settle with MBA because uh, MBA gives me the opportunity to you know have this flexibility to move into any field I wish to go into and uh, I don't have to just stick to one path so that flexibility was the reason why I chose an MBA yeah. Nice, 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 nice. Okay. So you said you were working as a what at, at KPMG? Oh, risk management consultant, financial oh, risk management. management. Okay, so you've basically been in the, the field, the, the business. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. For like almost four years. Oh, four nice, years, yeah. nice, nice. Okay. So what was the application and admission process like for you? Hmm. It was tedious because you had to combine that with work and while you're working you have deadlines you have uh, uh, essays to write and essays are like time consuming mm -hmm. like you have to write rewrite read it again yeah it's a lot of work and it was tedious for me uh, because sometimes i have deadlines from work i have deadlines to school sometimes yeah. i just write some stuff and just submit that way because i just have to meet deadlines but it was fulfilling when you get when you get the admission you actually feel fulfilled because it was worth it and all that mm. yeah so how many schools did you apply to i can remember applying to five schools okay you five schools that. um duke carlson uh schoolage in canada um there's a school in france i think yeah france i can't remember the name okay. um, um and one other school i can't remember so one of them <laughs> i got admitted to three yeah out of the five well okay yeah so you applied to duke university here in the u.s yes duke university university of minnesota minnesota then one in canada yeah one in france and then the final one i can't remember i think it was paris hec yeah okay. Can't I mean, remember. yeah, it could be that because, you know, they are known for their yeah. business programs. So, that's okay. why I, the schools I applied to. Okay, when you say Carlson, people, when you say Carlson, it means like mm -hmm. the Carlson School of Management, Management at the yeah. University of Minnesota. I just, yeah. you know, make that clear. <laughs> um, so, what factors did you consider when selecting and shortlisting the schools to apply to? Like, did you consider like location, the program, funding? Okay, um, so when I was actually deciding to go for an MBA. I used uh, topmbaschools.com. Okay. So I can't remember if that's the correct website, but something top MBA, that's the beginning. So um, I used the criteria for ROI. I used um, funding. I used percentage of international students that are accepted. Mm. I used um, percentage of students that also gets a job after okay and so those are the major the factors, factors i use that was arrow high so return on investment okay. so a high return on investment means when you actually put it because mba is very costly you have to have if what you are getting back is way way higher mm -hmm. so it depends on the percentage so i looked at those that have 
very high percentage yeah. that looked at them. So if you fall into every of that my category, I just shortlist it. Okay. But one major factor that later decided that actually streamlined all of them was the class size. Mm. So I wanted a place where I don't get lost in the crowd. So I have access to a lot of the resources. Yeah. I don't have a lot of people to compete with and mm. all that. So that was just my major factor for just streamlining all of them. Okay. That's good. That's really a good way of shortlisting institutions. I feel like learning one or two things, right? Um, and of course, sometimes like the type of program like you're applying for, you're trying to get into, also kind of determines that because like yeah. for some programs, there are some things that you'd be like, okay, return on investment, really? Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, for MBA, you put a, it's a lot of money. Yeah. I think it's over the least MBA. I think is over a hundred thousand in the US, though, hundred thousand dollars. So. Putting that amount of money going into that kind of investment, you need something that you know that will give you something worthwhile. Yeah. So, yeah. and you have to look for schools that you know that most of their graduates are, you know, getting to good jobs afterwards. Yeah. So, yeah. That's just it. That's, that's really good. So, um, <clears throat> but what actually, before we go to the next question, like, what's your background? Um, so, like, what did you study at the undergraduate level? I studied physics. Physics? So physics, from physics to business, how did that happen? <laughs> Nigeria happened. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, physics, uh, I think, a uh, funny story, uh, I did my youth service in a school. Yeah. So I thought, and I also did a, bit, a little bit of administrative duties. So while doing my administrative duty, I worked in the finance department. And so I helped them in, you know, helping with their books. And that's where I actually helped in creating some Excel models and all that to help them track and all that. And so that's where I started getting interested in finance. And then when I got the opportunity of working for, got uh, um, this advert on KPMG. Yeah. I decided I wasn't going to audit. I wanted something that could actually be still be analytical and still, um, what's it called? Not fully, totally finance, but mm -hmm. it still uses analytical processes. So an FRM is, that because you have to use a lot of you know risk analysis and all that yeah. you build a lot of models and all that to compute um, a lot of risk charges and all that so that's why I just that's how my story just moved from mm. you know going to this I was even planning on being a, a lecturer before but oh, <laughs> somehow you know decided to you know life just pushed me in yeah. here direction yeah. okay i mean it happens and there are a lot of people that do mba that don't even have background in like business like yeah, you could do yeah. english you know, especially if you want to get like some leadership skills and you want yeah, to yeah that, that's the that's the that's the good thing about mba yeah. you don't have to you know be in that line you just have to you know have like knowledge have experience work experience you mm -hmm. know so that you're able to come in with an experience of working yeah. so you're not someone who they throw into the business and then you're just learning how to do things. Yeah. But you already know that this is the right way to do things. Or you're just learning mm -hmm. how it is done in that company. Mm -hmm. so, nice, nice. And it nice, also nice. gives, because it puts you, it exposes you to leaders at a, a very early stage of your yeah. career. So you get to, you know, go out there, you're in a leadership position. Mm -hmm. You get out there to just throw you out there to just uh, go and interact, network, and all that. So yeah it's a lot of exposure gotcha and yeah. to specify your mba is masters of business administration yeah yeah because yeah. i know so that some folks not confuse it with like maybe business analytics so master of business no, that is MSB. yeah yeah, MSB. yeah okay so um what steps did you take like when applying did you like reach out to like grad coordinators did you reach out to students currently in the program did you do some research behind um so after i've shortlisted my yeah. courses so for my current school what i actually did was you know attend the various events that they um usually host yeah so when you get to the whole process what they are requiring what the essays, what they expect. So you get to learn a lot and you get to ask a lot of questions, things that are bothering you, things that you feel that, um, and then you get to ask from your own perspective. So after getting my information from that, I then I moved into Google. 
Google was the next option, yeah, because Google will tell you the essays. They have, um, I think, there are three essays you have to write. So, in order to have a different perspective from people who have actually done it and people who are admission experts, you, they explain what is expected. So, your knowledge from the school perspective and your knowledge from outside perspective will actually use it to, you know, create a story, because the school story might they might have a specific set of um, students that have been coming and so they might speak from that uh, point perspective but if you have um, an outsider perspective you can be able to relate and you know create that story and then relate it with what they want so that's what i just did i got the outsider perspective the school perspective and then created a story that could actually portray me and you know and that's it mm, yeah. okay so um what materials do you submit then um, so at when, at the point in time when I was actually doing my application, mm -hmm. GMAT was waived. Okay. I don't know about now if it's still waived. Um, but I actually did GMAT. Um, I also did, um, I wrote my essays and then I think that's all you write essays and then mm -hmm. fill in the application. Mm -hmm. Submit your transcripts. Yeah. And your yeah. CV. Like no, you don't. You don't submit uh, transcripts. Transcript is not transcript that you transcripts. Really? No, no. Academic transcripts. You do not need to submit. Yeah. You get. You submit it after um, you are given admission. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Okay. This is a new information. That's the official transcript. Oh. oh okay. The unofficial. You still you upload, upload it. it. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to. I was like, wait, tell me. That's <laughs> okay. No, no, All no, right. no, no. So clarify. Like, right. You upload your unofficial transcript. Yes, yes. So that's for. Was it for all the schools you applied all to? That was how it was. Official. No, you unofficial. Don't talk, yeah. You yeah, upload unofficial yeah. transcript yeah. on the portal, and then when you get, you know, you send them your yeah. official after you, send you decide. After you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just to clarify that, okay? Yeah. You still need your transcript. Yeah. <laughs> you're, just, you're just allowed to upload unofficial for yeah. the schools you apply to, okay? This yeah. applies to the schools that you apply to. That's that's good. And you add letters of recommendation as well. Yeah, right? so um, there are only two set of people that can actually recommend you for uh, uh, MBA. So they have to be people who you have worked with. Mm. So you can't meet uh, with someone who, maybe your professor. Yeah. If you have gone out of that field well, and he has not worked for, with you for like the current period, it has to be people either you, where you volunteered or somebody who has worked with you. So it has to be, it's not academic perspective now they are looking at. It's how your, uh, your working ethics and all that, that's what they want to look at. And, gotcha. uh, how because an MBA is looking at the perspective of what you are bringing to the class, your mm -hmm. experience you are bringing to the class. Yeah. So that's what they are looking at. So those are the two set of people, either your current employers or mm -hmm. your previous employers, or anybody that has worked with you. Okay. Yeah. okay. So after you secured admission, right, how did you decide which school to... <laughs> and the number one thing is always funding. <laughs> 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 you follow all look at because... MBA is very expensive. Yeah. So you look at the one with the least cost. Mm -hmm. Then after that, you now look at, okay, what are the other benefits that you get from yeah. taking this school? So you weigh the pros and cons. And <laughs> <laughs> I had Canada. Yeah. So I, I, I rejected France because they were only giving me 10,000 euros off, mm -hmm. which means I was going to be like 20,000 euros. And I'm like, nah, I'm not taking this cost. <laughs> so, <laughs> And that's outside of, um, you know, living expense. That's just too short. So I said, I'm not taking this mm -hmm. course. So I rejected that offer. So when I got my current school, I also got Canada school. So the Canada school was actually very much more lucrative than this one. In the sense that I get to get a PR. So that was a kind of a factor that I was actually considering. Yeah. But uh, Canada, the Canadian school was not giving me full tuition scholarship. It was giving me um, just a semester scholarship. And it means I have to, the following semester, I have to apply for another scholarship and keep on every semester every I'll be applying. Semester. Oh, gotcha. While this one is giving me the full year mm -hmm. and then can be renewed. Mm -hmm. Once I meet the criteria, which is just my academic standing, hmm. it will be renewed automatically. Yeah. So that was like, okay, I, instead of you know, carrying a huge debt, starting my career and I know that let me just take the least debt time since both still 
uh, will give me similar stuff and I can take this and if I wish to switch back to Canada, yeah. I can also do that. So I just took the one with the least debt. Okay. What so, school was it in Canada? Okay. Schoolage School of Business, if I remember. I okay. think that is Schoolage. School yeah, I think it's number one or number two mm -hmm. in Canada. So. Okay, well, if you're looking at Canada, you can consider that as a tip. But yeah, okay, that's that's nice though that you got yeah. a few t shirts. But did you have to apply separately? No, 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 it's it automatic. automatic. Yeah, once you apply to the apply. program. So that's why I also listed one of the criteria is funding because yeah. percentage of school students that receive funding mm -hmm. in Minnesota is about 90 something percent. Oh, wow. So almost everybody receives a form of scholarship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's nice. That's um, that's really really nice. Okay, yeah. so after admission, right? After you've now decided that okay, well, this is the school that I'm going to. So you know, what next? Like, what was the mm -hmm. process like for you after accepting? Ah, uh, okay. So when you accept the offer, you pay yeah. tuition deposit. Mm -hmm. Um, so tuition deposit was one five which will be later on, you'll be giving back to you. Mm. Right, so you have to pay $1,500? Yes, they will give you back, give back to your scholarship oh, back again. That's, that's interesting. So it's just for you to they know that you're serious, to mm. you're coming. So after that, you get your I-20, and then the struggle for visa in Nigeria starts. <laughs> so, so what happens is you go for to the website, and then you fill your details, and then book an appointment. Mm -hmm. Now, the available appointment in Nigeria is always crazy. It's usually maybe like, unless you have early, um, when I got my, this it was in February. So I got my uh, I-20 in February or early March. Okay. And then I applied. And then when the date I got was December, 2022. Yeah. So, and that was like way beyond when I was supposed to resume just August. So he, I, Kept on. So the tr the trick now is to the way people do usually is every day you keep on checking, yeah. checking, and then that dates you just pop up and then you reshare. Mm -hmm. So I got to reshare again. To um, you only do that twice, I think. You can only reshare it twice. I reshared it again till to September. I got a September date, but that was not good enough. So I decided to risk it and apply for emergency appointment, and I got lucky. I was approved and you know started preparing for the whole interview okay. process the whole i actually did a lot of research on questions they usually ask yeah so i also went online to ask research on reasons why people are rejected so the major reason is usually ties to home country i number one ties to home country and number two is no, it's majorly ties to home country, and the way they usually determine that is if they can determine that you are not someone who they know everybody. Most people will actually stay back, but when you want to do your visa interview, they want to know that at that point in time you are you plan to come back, and either you are maybe married, your spouse is back in Nigeria, or you have um, well properties in Nigeria, or you have um, um, something that, that will bring you back to Nigeria. Mm. I had none of that. So <laughs> that was what the scary part of, for me. So um, what I did was actually to look at other ways that you can actually prove that home ties. And the way you could do is your story. Mm -hmm. So when your story of why you're actually going is actually reasonable enough. It sees a car, there's a career progression, and they see that what you are going for is also needed back home in your country. They feel that there's a reason why you can come back because there's something back home that will actually take you back. So that was the story I had to you know, bring up to you know, uh, speak about, mm -hmm. and so I decided to you know go with uh, talking about you know the whole COVID and the whole what it happened, how it affected risk, how it affected the whole economy and how risk is now something for, uh, for center and it's something that every company is looking at and trying to bring into their operations and processes. So that was something I said, okay, let me get an MBA, you know, to now 
get a different perspective from another country. And so, yeah. so that was a story I decided to go with. So, but I did a lot of research and order to see rejection, hard questions, and look at perspective of other like former visa. Uh, what do you call them? I think visa interview or something. Yeah. Is it? I've forgotten what they call the people that interview you at the. The views, the visa officers. Visa officers, something like that. Yeah. So for my understanding, they give you opinions and all that of reason why people get rejected. Yeah. Because even on Naira Land, I even joined Naira Land. You see people with enough fund, enough um, what's it called properties back home. They still reject them. Right. So the thing is, they need to see the story, the progression, mm -hmm. and all that. So mm -hmm. that was just the whole thing. I need to do a lot of research and all that to ensure that I have a story to tell, yeah. a story that's very compelling to the visa officer. Yeah. And it was compelling. I mean, you're here, so. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Um, so what questions were you asked at the visa interview? Um, why this? Why the school yeah. and why MBA? Okay. And then they just look through. After that, they just look through okay. if you have funding, funding and all that. Okay. Um, so the story I told mm -hmm. actually answered if I was going to come back or not. Or not. So they didn't need to ask uh, that. Okay. Okay. So, all right. But usually they usually end up with. So your first story, your first twenty seconds or thirty seconds will determine if the visa officer is going to agree or not. Yeah. So if the visa officer, if already from the beginning, visa officer is already doubting uh, that the fact that you're actually going to school, mm -hmm. so it, there's a lot more questions that come up. Mm -hmm. So and the more they ask the questions, the more they are trying to determine if that means they are swinging towards not giving you. If they ask a lot more questions, which means they are doubting. Mm -hmm. But if sometimes, if you get me because of... Um, pressure they send you the answer the first question if they ask more questions and then you're able to you know convince them then they give you the white slip okay okay so the white slip is the you know everybody's <laughs> desire the pink slip yeah that's everyone's dread right yeah. right absolutely okay that's really good um so just kind of we we'll kind of backtrack a bit to the funding aspect so you actually mentioned that you had a full tuition scholarship, yeah. right? And I know like, you know, on the I-20, there's like tuition, there's room, um, I think room and board, books and things like that. So how did you show proof of funds for the remaining aspect? Okay, so yeah, the whole I-20 and um, the other source of funding that I understand yeah. are kind of like, like a circle. Like, so in my, um, I, so I went for a loan though. Oh, okay. Empower loan, so to complete the other deficit. Yeah. So for Empower, Empower will request for how much do you have, and then how much funding you have. So I had tuition um, from uh, from the school, mm -hmm. so and I needed to actually show um, some certain amount of money too. So you do that. They also look at your experience. They look at your previous earnings and yeah. all that. So. Uh, and then they look at because most of this funding, this loan, this and look at your potential, and because they look at your past and they look at your potential, and then you send your bank details, your bank, whatever, upload everything, upload your I twenty, upload your CV, upload your pay stub. So once you upload all those things, that's, those are just evidence to things you have filled. Mm -hmm. If you feel that you have uh, five thousand dollars in your account. They need to see the equivalent in error that so in your bank statement then bank statement has to be like in last 30 days stamped and all that then you have um um no it doesn't have to be stamped i think it was actually e-copy i requested for e-copy and i uploaded it okay so it wasn't um the same uh then i think i uploaded i think that was all mm -hmm. funding Proof of funding, which is a bank statement, yeah. the proof of funding from the school, my CV. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all. Then you fill up all the other questions they ask. Yeah. And then you, the amount you want. Uh, did you have to tell them why you needed the loan? No, no, no. Once they see your, your admission letter, too. Yeah. So once your admission letter is there and all that. So because the way they do it, before they give you the loan, they actually request. So once you are approved, yeah. the amount you request for, they actually send it to the school. For the school to approve that it, that amount is not exceeding what you need. Gotcha. So, so it doesn't come to you at all. 
So it goes to the school, then yeah. the school gives you. So that's why the school has to approve that that amount is yeah. not too much. So mm-hmm. if, for example, you're because these every school you already have cost of attendance. Yeah. So if they have already given like if your cost of attendance is one twenty, mm-hmm. and they've given you hundred thousand, they don't mm-hmm. expect that your money, the amount you are requesting for a loan shouldn't be more than twenty thousand. Gotcha. So it, that's why they send it to the school to actually mm-hmm. approve. And that's the amount they should send. Send you and how did they did it show up on your i twenty? Did the school put it there as loan or? Yeah, the school put it yeah. as a it's a private loan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they put it as it's actually a private loan in bracket and mm-hmm. power something. Like that. Gotcha. Okay, so, so after because you already had a full tuition, so they put that tuition yes, yes. amount yeah. and then they now put yeah. the and that covered. And yeah. Then. So um and sometimes you can just put in your personal um what's it called font. So mm-hmm. if you put in your because in your I twenty before you get your I twenty, you are sent a form to fill. Mm-hmm. So in that section of funding, you put in your funding because you have your letter. You put in how much for the year. Yeah. Then you put in if you want to put your personal finances, mm-hmm. which is recommended, and then your uh, deficit, whatever deficit you have. Gotcha. You could actually exceed the actual cost of attendance. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter in your I twenty, but in your what will you receive in actual, in reality, will be whatever the school approves. When you're at 20, you could actually get approval for $40,000, put it there, $40,000. Mm-hmm. But that's not what will actually come to you in the end. Mm-hmm. It's going to be whatever the school approves. Approves? Yeah. Gotcha. And in the in the DS-160, did you also kind of include that? Like, Because I know there's a funding yes, section. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. DS-160. I've even forgotten that. <laughs> because, uh, that. <laughs> So the, in the DS, that's where you fill up your details, uh, whoever, your relatives in the US, or whatever. Yeah. So in that part, you then put in your funding. So you can add fund as much funding as possible if it's from here. Yeah. Okay. So that's that section they usually look at when the viewer is looking at this. They look at your funding and then they will be able to see, oh, you have scholarship, you have a fun, uh, funding. Mm-hmm. So they already know the cost of attendance. Mm-hmm. Because what they do is, uh, in the I-20, the I-20 lists your cost of attendance. And so they look at your funding. So that's the same thing you just upload. Gotcha. And that's even what the visa officer will okay. look at your I-20. Mm-hmm. And then what is in your DS-160. Yes, the DS-160 is like just the non-immigrant visa um, application that you yeah. fill out once you have your I-20 in order to apply for a U.S. Um, so when, you, when you're even going for your interview, you have yeah. to go with evidence of what you filled. So if you feel that... Uh, that you have a loan, a scholarship, and or you have um, personal money that you used to fund, mm-hmm. you have to actually take your bank statement, which is not less than 30 days. Yeah. And your bank statement, th- when I say not less than 30 days, it means when you received the bank statement, it should not be more than 30 days mm-hmm. before your interview. Yeah. So, but your bank statement should, most times it's always, advisable to take one year bank statement because the reason why um, um, some people actually are rejected is they need to know that that account is something that has been working yeah, it's not something that you just followed in a certain huge amount because they know nigerians play some hacking packing with those bank statements they can just you not know, take money from someone put it in there and then leave it there and then just for the visa interview yeah and then take it out back so that's just what you have to be careful of, you know. They need to see that that account is operating like you usually receive some huge amount of money. Yeah, it's not like and if there's any huge um amount that comes in that cannot be explained based on your income, there's it's I think there's a space in the DS when one sister or something the way you put in some comments to state that uh, this is some reasons why this statement or code or something like that. Mm-hmm. So just to explain so that because sometimes some piece of her don't just ask questions. They just see that and see that as a red flag. And then flag you yeah, are rejected straight up. Yeah, yeah. I always encourage people generally like if you're able to take a bank statement that shows like at least six months of funds, like transfer of funds over time and yeah. things like that. Like it's really awful. Um, it shows like, okay, well, this money has been here, this is the flow of cash and blah, blah, blah. In case they ask where it can easily present it. And if you yeah. actually got it from someone, maybe your parents put yeah. the money into your account, you actually have to... And you explain that you can actually... Because they will ask you for 
your parents' income is also part of the decision, your parents' income and all that. So it's also advisable to when you're going, you can actually take whosoever um, funded you, their bank statement, yep. just to show that the person has that money to fund you. And the person has to be a close relative, like parents, your actual parents or brother. And if it's your brother, it has to be someone who doesn't have responsibilities. Because then you have to prove to the person that why would, unless the person has been someone who has been taking care of you right from the beginning, then that is a story that can be bought. But if you have brother and then you are just maybe you have parents, your brother is has his own family and then they are asking, how why would your brother, you know, put this huge amount of money for you when he has his own family? So that's kind of like a question. But if it's fam mother, father, that's not a question. All the other questions what what they do all righty well thank you very much um for sharing mm-hmm. your experience with us so like i'm just going to we're kind of wrapping up now but okay. at the same time before we wrap up i want to ask like what has the educational experience been like for you here in the u.s you know have you experienced any culture shock in general or like what has you know educational experience what, are the, what has it been like for you just let's say two words soft life <laughs> Soft life. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's so totally different. I mean, you, you you do take home exam, like take home exam. When I heard it, I'm like, okay, take home exam. I can look at it. And the questions are things that are related to what you are given in class. Yeah. Or they would have told you, oh, go and read this. And then you have access to that thing that they say you should read and answer the question. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> In Nigeria, when they give you A in class, your exam is Z. Then you start cracking your brain on what you actually learned without having access to anything. Even the formulas you need, you are giving access to all the formulas you need and all that. So that's one part. Then the other part that's kind of shocking is you know the way you relate with your lecturers. You can actually uh, notice your lecturer. Uh, and then the way they won some, I think there was one person that even said, oh, I'm tired today, the weather is cold, I'm not coming to class. And I'm like, in Nigeria, you don't do that. You definitely don't do that. You are repeating that class. <laughs> so I think that's what, soft life just is the whole story of the years. Okay. Okay. So. All right, so I guess it has been a good experience for you. <laughs> it has been, yeah. and it has not been. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by it has not been? <laughs> Um, I think it's the the fact that you know it's easy to you know build relationships with you know um when you're in Nigeria and you guys work together it's yeah. easy to just bond easily but here yeah, working together doesn't mean we bond mm-hmm. after that time that's the end that's the end of it they just go their separate ways and everybody moves on. Yeah. Unless already you have something else, and most especially, you, what I've noticed is, is the international students that are getting closer. The residents, the US kind of students are not. It's just like you, once you have something to do with them, you are close then after them. That's everybody right. goes their separate ways. Yeah. So that's just one part I, I really didn't like. But, well, yeah. were, but in any case, they are still good people. Like they are not that you they push you aside, but you get involved in everything. But you know that bond, the way you create the bond, and then everybody just creating their own bond. But that's mm-hmm. not most people that the bond you create are mostly with your fellow international student. Well, to get bond with someone who is actually a U.S. citizen, eh, it's very rare. It's not uh, all the time it's mostly you do something together and then at that point in time mm-hmm. we are together after a while after that thing is done yeah move on yeah definitely yeah, i do agree that friendship the concept of friendship is kind mm-hmm. of different yeah. here to an extent yeah definitely notice that with like group work in class and everything and you'll be like oh you know we really chill yeah. out we talk a lot yeah. like <laughs> but after that you may even say hello to yeah. the person you know i'm like wait what like we just did group work so, for like three months so that um, does it it's, just, yeah. it's weird yeah. yeah definitely i agree with that okay so as we kind of conclude what advice do you have for just starting out the process or currently applying or even 
what what advice do you have in general and what would you like people to know start early because start early. if you want to receive fund you have to apply before the january most people is usually january that's the last deadline for yeah. international student that want to receive funding any other person that wants to receive funding if you can't apply before the january deadline you can't receive funding it's usually very hard to get funding anymore so you usually start early you know most times you need to do your research starts because you have to do a lot of research and determine the schools you want to go and your goal whatever goal you actually decide on you should add your school should be based on what you want it shouldn't be based on where people are going to it should be based on what you want to gain and what you want to um achieve you through that and you should also ensure that you put a lot of research ensure that every your research is based on what you already you know streamlined as these are my priorities yeah. so once you have gotten your priorities some people have priorities of the fact that uh, i want places where um maybe there are they want some people have maybe priorities to say oh I don't want these other criteria. I want these other criteria. Some will say, "Oh, I want places where they have um, um, for MBA now." If for for some masters, it will be like, "Oh, I want places where they have this number of you no know, professors. I want places where they have this number of you know maybe companies around. I want these places where they have." So, depending on your criteria, whatever you want and whatever you want to achieve. Some people determine that oh I want this aspect of some people it's the cold the climate they look at the climate to determine which school so whatever it is it should be based on what you want then you use that do research do every research get your document ready as early as possible you know maybe starting from August you should have gotten your documents ready and all that because it takes a lot of time to do your personal statement your personal statement is your main document and you have to write. Right, because there are a lot of deadlines you meet for different schools. So, yeah. different you can't write the same personal statement for different because different schools have what they look for. For for counseling, you look at they mostly look out for that. Yeah, your 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 plan, your goal is to change the world. Like do things that um, because their goal, their motto is always counseling business for good. So. Whatever your plan is, you want to see that you are trying to make the society better. So that's what most schools have different things they look out for. Some look out for people who have shown leadership. So you can't write the same personal statement for the same school. That doesn't work. That's to be what people look out for. That's what you used to know. Create a story, because and your personal statement should always be a story. It should always be. They should see a program. It should be like you are telling a story, starting from here to point A to point B. So that the reader can just follow you through, and they don't read this thing in depth. They just, if they can't capture, if you can't capture their attention, the first paragraph, that's the end. They don't look at the rest. So you have to, the story has to be compelling to say, capture your audience and all that. So that's why it's always uh, good to start early, so you're able to revise, give other people to read, and I think that's all. Yeah, once you can do that, yeah, good. Awesome. good to go. Alrighty, well, thank you very much for the tips. Uh, we all you heard from Caleb. He has shared his own <laughs> MBA journeys, admission process with us, and you know, including the Empower Loan, because I know, um, I feel like I've probably in about two comments or something, you know, I've seen people ask about the Empower Loan, you know, how do you get Empower Loan? They mm. told you that, you know, just apply. <laughs> and stop it all necessary um, documents. So, there you have it people and if you'd like to you know check out other fully funded programs you can go to iechronicles.com the link is in the description but um is in the description box uh there are some fully funded programs even mba right there's a fully funded mba list there like schools that provide funding for an mba degree there's like um i think economics basically you see a lot of programs there public health as well um so a lot of programs that you're looking for, you're trying to find funding, and like, okay, what program will fund this? And even there are a lot of videos on my channel um, with regards to like fully funded programs and scholarship opportunities. So I encourage you to check it out. And if you're trying to explore other stories, right, other people's experience, it's also on the channel as well. Um, so you can check it out. And, uh, you know, it's actually filming this video on Christmas Day. 
<laughs> but I don't know when you're going to be watching it. Probably sometime in January. So uh, if you're watching this now, I wish you a happy new year. If I've not already wished you a happy new year. But yeah, people, I hope you find this video helpful and make sure to give this video a thumbs up, okay? And just make it happy holidays. So yeah, oh, that's specific. true. <laughs> happy holidays. <laughs> happy, we say happy holidays. That way there's no specific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so happy holidays, people. And you know. Just stay safe out there and be good. And don't forget to subscribe, okay? Click that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Alrighty. Bye. <laughs>